Early in 2001, Minnesota Vikings running back Robert Smith shocks the football world and announces his retirement at age 28. It ends an eight-year adventure that began in 1993 when the Vikings drafted him in the first round and handed him a jersey numbered 44. That was the number once worn by Chuck Foreman, who to that point was the greatest running back in Vikings history. Smith admitted that he'd never heard of Foreman, explaining, well, I'm not that much of a football fan. In fact, he looked a lot more stoked to make a cameo appearance on the locally produced Mystery Science Theater 3000, which he'd been a huge fan of for years. When he says being a Viking pales in comparison to this, I don't think he's joking. In college, he'd become obsessed with the work of cloning and sequencing genes, and in the pros, he spends his free time on 56k internet scrutinizing all the Hubble telescope images he can get his hands on. Predictably, the supposition is that he is quote-unquote too intellectual, the label anonymous football people love to assign to players who are supposedly the wrong kind of smart. It's like saying you're too tall to play the trumpet. Who gives a shit, especially when you can do this? In his prime years between 1998 and 2000, Smith rushed for six rushing touchdowns of at least 50 yards, twice as many as anyone else. Barry Sanders, Terrell Davis, whoever. He was the consummate big play specialist, but the biggest play falls a little bit before this sample in 1995. Against the Steelers, he cuts out of traffic, and about 10 yards into his run, his shoe gets ripped off. You'd think this would make him at least a little bit easier to catch, but he goes the distance, using the one cleat he still does have to plant into a devastating stutter step and take it the rest of the way. It's a demonstration of the same resilience that let him bounce back from countless injuries, a torn ACL, torn ankle ligaments, and a torn MCL and PCL. It all paid off in his monster 2000 season, in which Smith rushed for more than 1,500 yards and broke the all-time franchise record for rushing yardage. He's only 28. He's about to enter free agency, where he figures to land a massive contract, and then he just… retires. In an autobiography he publishes four years later, Smith finally tells the whole story, shooting down all the popular theories along the way. It wasn't his knees, his surgeon actually encouraged him to keep on playing. It wasn't his sometimes strained relationship with Randy Moss, with whom he got into it a couple times, but described overall as a good guy and a good teammate. It wasn't anything dramatic, like heartbreak over not winning a Super Bowl. On page 168, he finally gets right down to it. Well, I'm not much of a football fan. After the heartbreak of 1998, the Minnesota Vikings enter the 99 draft holding the 11th overall pick courtesy of flipping Brad Johnson to Washington. A small silver lining for a 15-win team, but despite two veteran quarterbacks firmly entrenched atop their depth chart, they take a quarterback of the future who turned that pick into a massive silver lining. Born in prison and immediately adopted by a remarkable woman named Emma Culpepper who'd already taken in and raised 14 other children, Dante Culpepper, Florida's Mr. Football, went on to become a high school legend, the best quarterback not just in the state, but in the nation. He was on the fast track to stardom at his pick of huge football powerhouses, but after his junior year, some academic shortcomings threatened to throw a wrench in those plans. When Paul Lounsbury, the offensive line coach for the much less prestigious University of Central Florida, had traveled to Culpepper's high school to recruit him his senior year, he noticed a transcript with a GPA that needed a lot of work to gain academic eligibility to play college football. He and Culpepper's high school head coach crafted a plan to boost Dante's grades, and after working his ass off his senior year, he drastically improved his overall average to clear that 2.0 threshold. Now, of course, the bigger schools try to butt their way back in to woo him, but it's too late. Culpepper is too loyal, and the University of Central Florida bears the fruit of that loyalty. The most sought-after quarterback recruit in the country, playing in arguably the most college football crazed state in the country, chose to attend an underdog Division II school. It took all of one game into his freshman season before Joe Namath declared him the second best passer he had ever seen. He'll eventually guide the Knights to a 9-2 record after moving up to Division I, wrapping up a prolific career in Orlando. The man has the size of a linebacker, the speed of a defensive back, the arm strength to throw a football over 80 yards flat-footed, and the accuracy to break Steve Young's completion percentage record. 
By the time his draft night rolls around, Emma has seen grandkids have grandkids before stepping on an airplane for the first time in her 84 years of life, enabling her to be at Madison Square Garden to both see her son enter the NFL and forever rule out coach travel. Though she has to watch three quarterbacks taken at the top of the draft before Dante's name is called, in the Vikes' eyes, he's better than all of them. Now in Minnesota as their third-string quarterback, he has the luxury of learning the ropes from his childhood idol, even choosing Randall's Eagles digits for his rookie year when he can't prize college number loose from Todd Bauman. In his second season, Culpepper takes over the top spot on the Viking depth chart, wins each of his first seven games, leads the league in passing touchdowns, tacks on another seven on the ground, and is named a Pro Bowl starter in one of the greatest all-time seasons by a first-year starting quarterback. He quickly forms a dynamite rapport with Randy Moss, who, after a 99 season where he'd blown everyone else out of the water in receiving through two seasons of a career, maintains a similar stranglehold through three seasons. On the ground, Robert Smith produces at a level high enough to be the league's best rusher in plenty of other neighboring seasons, and even in a year when Marshall Falk and Edron James had the best seasons in their Hall of Fame careers, Smith is right there with them. That explosive, well-rounded offense carries them to 11 wins, a division title, and a first round bye. The New Orleans Saints, fresh off their first ever postseason win, head to Minnesota for the divisional round. The Vikings defense, which floundered down the stretch of the regular season and becoming the only playoff team to ever allow over 30 points in each of their final three games, comes out rejuvenated with a week off. After they force a quick three and out to open up against Aaron Brooks and company, the Vikes need barely a minute before Culpepper delivers a pinpoint pass to an in-stride Moss who's evaded the jam against cover two, gets an assist from some safety over pursuit that opens a gaping cutback lane, flips on the turbo boosters, and no one's catching him on a 53-yard score to grab the early 7-0 lead and send the Metrodome into an absolute frenzy. Despite losing defensive players left and right, patching 11-man groups together with duct tape and Gorilla Glue, they hold strong, only allowing a field goal and three punts over the next four Saints possessions. Near the end of the first half, even playing on a bad high ankle sprain can't stop Culpepper from punishing the Saints D on the ground or embracing contact at the end. The next snap, he gives Chris Carter a chance to make a play with the corner draped all over him, and he outleaps the coverage while maintaining his concentration for the highlight reel touchdown to reward his quarterback's trust and take a 14-point lead at the break. After Moss had so much fun taking Culpepper's second pass of the first half for a super long touchdown, he takes Culpepper's second pass of the second half, and even in a damn phone booth along the sidelines, his sheer overwhelming 0-60 speed renders every angle every Saint takes to be awful and turns that one into a super long touchdown as well. To this day, it is the only time a player has scored multiple offensive touchdowns in a Super Bowl era playoff game that started on his own side of the field. With the defense continuing to smother the Saints, only allowing 10 points before garbage time, this proves to be the knockout punch that leads to smooth sailing the rest of the way in an 18 point win. For the second time in three years, the Vikings stand one win away from the Super Bowl. This is the 40th year of Minnesota Vikings football. Ten-year-olds who are in the stands of Metropolitan Stadium to watch their brand new team win their first ever game 37-13 in 1961, well, they're now 50 years old. When a sports franchise reaches this age, stories and traditions and memories become lore, passed down from grandparents to grandkids. What used to be silly fight songs are starting to become anthems. When the Metrodome opened in 1982, then general manager Mike Lynn wanted to do away with their longtime fight song, Skull Vikings, entirely. In 2023, though, the word Skull is inseparable from the Vikings' identity. When exactly fans began reclaiming it is tough to pin down precisely, but it really seems to have taken hold around this time. Fans even sing Skull Vikings after touchdowns. It's just what you do now. Despite being the road team, the Vikings roll into the Meadowlands as two and a half point favorites against a Giants team with a strong defense, but without the kind of inspiring passing game you typically need to make a deep playoff run. For instance, the kind these Vikings have in the terrifying combo of Culpepper, Moss, and Chris Carter. It's believed that Minnesota can win this one by three touchdowns. They're headed to Super Bowl 35. They can feel it. They got this one.
The Giants are first to receive, and the Vikings expect Kerry Collins and his conservative offense to open by establishing the run. Instead, he immediately targets the Vikings' tragic flaw, their secondary. When receiver Ike Hilliard effortlessly knifes his way through coverage, Collins finds him for an easy six. Moments later, with the Vikings set to answer back, the kickoff falls into no man's land. Neither Troy Walters nor Mo Williams can decide which of them should feel this thing, so both of them do. They collide, the ball comes loose, New York comes up with it, they immediately score again, and the Giants take a 14-0 lead before the Vikings offense has even had the chance to step on the field, and judging by everything that follows, it's hard to say whether they ever really do. Vikings fans never even get to sing their very special touchdown song today. Not even once. In one of the most shocking outcomes to an NFL playoff game ever seen, the Giants humiliate them by a score of 41-0. They did everything they felt like doing this afternoon, whether that was making quick touchdown strikes, snapping off big gains, forcing turnovers on three of the Vikings' four second-half possessions, or, at the end, just sitting on the ball for the final 13 minutes of the game. I'm not sure which of these NFC Championship losses is more painful. At least with this one, you can sit back and laugh. That's <laughs> really all you can do. This was only the second time in NFL playoff history that a team was shut out and trailing by at least 30 points at halftime. The other time, incidentally, was when the Cowboys did it to them in 96. Being shut out in the playoffs is the ultimate embarrassment, especially in the 21st century, when we've only seen it happen five times. In terms of margin of defeat, it's tied for the second worst shutout loss in postseason history. As always, number one goes to Washington, who lost 73 to nothing to Chicago in 1940. But you know what? At least they can say they attempted a field goal. A lot of the teams on this unfortunate chart can at least say that. When we shade out all those to leave only those whose kicker never even got to try, this game emerges as a strong contender for the title of saddest playoff loss ever. The one and only time they crossed the Giants' 30-yard line, it was only because they started with excellent field position, and they only got off two snaps before giving the ball right back. Never made it to the 30 again. All the way up through 2022, this remains the Vikings' worst margin of defeat in any game, regular season or playoffs, in the last 38 years. With this loss, those Super Bowl appearances of the 1970s fall even further out of view. On the second day of training camp before the 2001 season, Vikings right tackle Corey Stringer collapsed due to heat stroke and died 15 hours later. He was only 27 years old. 2001 was going to be Stringer's seventh season with the Vikings. He was drafted with the 24th overall pick in 1995 and was probably the only first rounder who wasn't watching on TV. Instead, he put the Lion King in the VCR and simply waited for the phone to ring. He just didn't need the stress. Stringer had this way of loosening up everybody around him. He was famous for his impressions. He could deliver a spot-on impersonation of anybody in the building, from Dennis Green to Todd Stusey, but he perfected his impression of offensive line coach Mike Tice. Stringer was a lover of witty one-liners. They seemed to come out of him without effort. Sometimes they helped to defuse tense situations, other times they just helped to pick you up a little bit. Sid Hartman, who'd covered the Vikings since the day they were founded, said Stringer may have been the most universally beloved player in the history of the franchise. Of all Vikings past and present, it might have been the recently retired Robert Smith who felt the loss of Stringer most uniquely. Stringer had blocked for Smith not only during their years with the Vikings, but as his teammate at Ohio State. After Stringer's passing, Smith, who had avoided the media in the months since his surprise retirement, tried to find the words to communicate the relationship they shared. The running back always scores the touchdowns and enjoys the roars of the crowd, but Smith preferred not to celebrate. At the end of the play, Robert would run back to Corey, or Corey would run to Robert. They'd find each other. Many beautiful words have been written and spoken about Corey Stringer by those who actually knew him. More than two decades later, we asked ourselves what exactly we could offer here. We decided on the thing that, as far as we can tell, he's never really gotten. The thing offensive linemen virtually never get. A highlight reel. Corey Stringer excelled in pass protection, but more fun than that is how much of an absolute road grader he was in the ground game, where we can start things off in Pittsburgh with the very first touchdown of the very first road start of his career, the aforementioned shoeless Robert Smith carry. The springboard for what turns into the longest rushing touchdown in six years against the Steelers is Stringer's down block helping seal off the backside of Pittsburgh's defense so that Smith could cut right with ease into open field. 
the very next game in overtime against Houston, about half the Oiler defense tries to bring Smith down, but behind the safety of Stringer, he's able to scamper free and glide into the end zone for the walk-off score. Later in his rookie season, it's Amp Lee who's the beneficiary of the vast hole created up the gut by Stringer on a 66-yard touchdown versus the Bucks. The next year against the Packers, he shuts down Reggie White and in the closing minutes demonstrates his ability to deliver delicious pancakes at the second level, springing Smith loose for the late go-ahead score. In 2000 against the Bills, Smith darts through the defense beside a flattening Stringer kickout block to pick up 20 yards, and on a Monday nighter in Lambeau Field two weeks later, Stringer helps with a double team block on the end before climbing to the next level and getting enough of the linebacker to unlock another explosive Smith carry. The following game versus the Cardinals, he again manhandles a defensive lineman, moving him wherever his heart desires. In this case, far, far away from Robert Smith. Stringer's position on the field seemed to perfectly reflect his character. He made a lot of donations, particularly to youth sports programs and community centers, but he always preferred to do so quietly. Just as you didn't need to know how those 50-yard touchdowns happened, you didn't need to know where the money came from. He didn't want the recognition. Seeing the success of others was all he needed. Corey's widow, Kelsey Stringer, has since spent many years advocating for player safety at every level of the sport. She filed a lawsuit against the NFL that eventually resulted in funding for the Corey Stringer Institute. Its advocacy has helped to directly result in massive changes nationwide in the form of available facilities, protocols, and training. It's quite likely that in the decades since, these changes have saved many lives. In far less important matters, the Vikings finished 2001 with a 5-11 record. It's the first and only losing season of Dennis Green's decade-long tenure as head coach, one in which he led the Vikings to 97 regular season wins. To this day, that's second most in franchise history, behind only Bud Grant. Normally it'd be borderline outrageous to fire a 10-year coach after his first bad season, but that's what owner Red McCombs effectively does at season's end by buying Green out of his contract. Strictly in terms of on-field results, Green's story is one of caveats on top of caveats. When he took the job in 92, the team was still feeling the shockwaves reverberating from the Walker trade, but he nonetheless inherited three future Hall of Famers. His teams became infamous for falling flat in the playoffs, but he was often dealt such a bad hand by stingy ownership that even reaching the playoffs was an achievement. He earned the loyalty of his players, but toward the end, he seemed for a time to lose even his staunchest locker room advocates, including Robert Smith and Chris Carter. Green's infamous decision to have Randall Cunningham take a knee while knocking on the door of the Super Bowl will echo throughout the ages, but Cunningham was only there to bring him that far in the first place because Green saw potential in the retired quarterback that nobody else in the NFL did. His record as a talent evaluator isn't perfect, but when he was right, he was not only really right, but the only one who was right. Particularly when he drafted Randy Moss and Dante Culpepper, unfooled by the narratives that had scared off the rest of the league. And yet, it was Green's perceived inability to rein in Randy Moss that helped put him on the hot seat. That's by no means an easy task, nor has it been easy for Moss to rein himself in. Suppose you literally grew up in a place where the walls told you they hated you, there was nothing you can do about it, and the one moment it seemed like you could do something about it, it resulted in a terrible mistake that landed you in jail. Then, in the span of about four years, you vaulted from jail to national megastar and recipient of a $75 million contract, and it's around this time that you're emotionally crushed by the tragic loss of your friend. If you say you would handle all that with perfect manners, then hats off. I am impressed. I don't think I would. Neither does Randy. His antics of late range from squirting a water bottle at an official during a playoff loss in 99, to yelling at a team sponsor who supposedly took his seat on the bus and wouldn't give it up, to saying, quote, I'll play hard when I feel like it, a comment that'll follow him for years, despite Green's insistence that it was a joke taken out of context. The feeling that Green has given him special treatment is another reason he's fallen out of favor. But the final precipitating factor behind Green's dismissal, incredibly, seems to be his refusal to move on from coach Richard Solomon, whose job title has shifted multiple times over the years, but who still retains an unusually high level of authority. This trend began years ago, when Solomon was the subject of multiple harassment claims that Green casually brushed aside as non-issues. Players had serious issues with Solomon then, and years later they still did. One former player, Dwayne Clemens, described his treatment of corner Ramos McDonald while serving as DB coach. 
Clemens says Solomon didn't really coach him so much as single him out and treat him like shit on a daily basis. Solomon escalated things even further by instigating a physical altercation with McDonald during a game. McDonald was waived soon after. Solomon stayed. Finally, Red McComb stepped in and told Green to move on from Solomon and Green just wouldn't. That might have been the last straw. After leaving Minnesota, when Green emerges as a candidate for the top job in Washington, they explicitly tell him he cannot bring Solomon with him. Later, Green is hired as head coach of the Arizona Cardinals. He brings Solomon with him. Congratulations to the Baltimore Ravens winners of Super Bowl 35. That is their first. Congratulations to the New England Patriots winners of Super Bowl 36. That is their first. Congratulations to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers winners of Super Bowl 37. That is sure as hell their first. So to open the 21st century, we see a very new franchise that had posted exactly one winning record ever, a pretty substandard franchise, and a franchise that spent most of its history as the laughing stock of football, all rewarded with Lombardi trophies. Enough of the rat race though. The last decade of Minnesota Vikings football has been, for both the best and the worst reasons, intense. We would really appreciate a little bit of catharsis, and we receive it within the Mike Tice era. Tice is gonna take a lot of criticism during his tenure, a lot of which is fair, but I gotta say, I'm a big fan. He's a true character, a very Long Island guy, who upon his promotion from offensive line coach to head coach, made every effort to pace the sideline in a suit and tie Pat Riley style before the joyless powers that be shot him down. Win or lose, he earns a lot of credibility with his players, having formerly been a Vikings tight end himself. During his long NFL career, he was more of a blocking tight end than a receiving threat, as was typical in his era. In 93 against the Niners, he scored his final touchdown, and he was all set to commemorate it with his very special dance he called the Herman Munster Shuffle. Oh, look, Mike, you made it on ESPN. They're actually showing it. You're looking great. Uh, they cut it off. Ah, dang it. This will be an era of goofs and spoofs and debacles and petty disasters, many of which aren't Mike Tice's fault at all. The first comes during the 2002 draft, the first high visibility moment of his head coaching career. Every team gets 15 minutes to make their pick, and in the first round, the Cowboys have used up all their time trying to trade theirs away. Now by rule, the Vikings, who are the next team up, are allowed to cut him in line. They really want defensive tackle Ryan Sims, so they scribble his name on a card and give it to a runner employed by the league. The future of this proud franchise now relies on the legs of some random NFL guy and his ability to hop to it and make it to that podium. Unfortunately, this runner is apparently more of a brisk walker. Just in time, the Cowboys complete the trade with the Chiefs who immediately select Ryan Sims. Ah, dang it. Well, the Vikings ended up with Bryant McKinney, who, according to Stathead's approximate value, will end up being more valuable in the long run, so no harm done. Now, Tice is a jovial, fun-loving guy, but he also takes his job very seriously, and he really wants to return these Vikings to greatness. During his first season, a top priority is to work with Randy Moss, with whom he has a pretty close relationship to avoid the off-the-field incidents that have distracted the team in recent years. The Vikings lose their first game. The Vikings lose their second game. The Vikings lose their third game. Ah, dang it. Moss has been arrested on suspicion of second-degree assault. It's later reduced to a couple of misdemeanors after it's learned what actually went on here. September 24th, 2002, Minneapolis, Minnesota, corner of 7th and Marquette. Randy is westbound on 7th, stopped at a red light in the center lane. He decides now he wants to turn right despite not having merged into the turning lane. At the intersection is a traffic agent, who, it should be clarified, is not a sworn officer. She blows her whistle and notifies Randy of this illegal turn. Randy continues his right turn regardless. The traffic agent places herself in front of Randy's Lexus, still blowing the whistle. Randy continues to creep forward at perhaps one or two miles per hour. The traffic agent now resolves to turn around and sit on the hood of the Lexus. Witness accounts published by the Minneapolis Star Tribune paint a somewhat unclear picture. Either she's sitting on the hood or half sitting and half walking as the car continues to creep forward into the turn at perhaps one to two miles per hour. The two are now fully engaged in a battle of wills. 
Both parties are very clearly doing things they should not be doing. Randy has obviously committed a minor traffic violation and has disregarded the instruction of a public employee tasked with upholding traffic law. If this traffic agent feels disrespected, that's very understandable, but sitting on a moving car is neither her duty nor a responsible course of action. This, uh, well, whatever the hell is going on here, it continues for an entire half a block with the traffic agent riding along with Randy at perhaps two miles per hour before Randy decides this is not a feasible long-term solution. He stops, waits at his vehicle until police arrive, and is arrested. Multiple witnesses report that it was very clear Moss had no intent of harming the traffic agent, with one simply saying, quote, That is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Moss doesn't miss any playing time. The Vikings rebound somewhat from their 0-3 start to finish 6-10. Time for the 2003 NFL Draft. Here, Tice and the Vikings find themselves in the same situation the Cowboys were in a year ago. They hold the 7th overall pick, they've already decided for sure that they want defensive tackle Kevin Williams, and they think he'll still be on the board later. So the Vikings spend their time on the clock negotiating with Baltimore, trying to trade this pick for their later pick, plus a couple other picks in late rounds. Baltimore agrees. Great. Deal's done. All that's left to do now is for both teams to call the league and report the trade. Baltimore picks up the phone and calls the league, or so they say. Huh. Busy signal. No problem. Let's just try another line. Another busy signal. Oh well. We'll just keep on trying. Wait! No, you can't do- No! Ah, dang it. The Jaguars have cut them in line. The Panthers have cut them in line. Nobody's ever seen anything like this. As fate would have it, one of ESPN's analysts on the broadcast tonight is none other than Dennis Green, who's more than happy to clown the organization that showed him the door. They can turn the pick at any time. Again, same thing we had happen last you year. You know it's got to have the pick. Well, guess what, Dennis? If you want back last year. Realizing that this is only going to keep happening, the Vikings finally cut their losses and give up on the trade. Their guy is still on the board, so they take him. Amazingly. Despite a miscue one year and an incomprehensible screw-up the very next year, the Vikings end up pretty much fine both times. The lesson here? Uh, you can pretty much just draft whoever. They're all pretty good. The 2003 Minnesota Vikings win each of their first five games of the season heading into their week six bye, and safety Brian Russell notches a pick in all of them, the first player in 24 years to pull that off. He then intercepts a pass early in week 7, becoming the first player ever to do so in each of the first six games of a season, and it's not even the most noteworthy development of the first half. On a third and a million, with only seconds until recess of a tie game, Dante Culpepper, back in the lineup after breaking his back, does the only reasonable thing. Just as he's about to get planted into the turf, he heaves the ball deep toward Moss, who comes down with it inside Denver's 15, where the Bronco secondary converges on him. Out of the corner of his eye, he catches a glimpse of purple, taps into his point guard roots, and dishes a no-look pass to the trailing Mo Williams, who takes the delivery the final 15 yards to complete the PlayStation play. It's something he fools around with to wrap up every week of practice. Usually, Denard Walker picks it off, including yesterday. Mike Tice cannot stand it. Center Matt Burke cannot stand it. Now, they eat their crow. Minnesota goes on to win the game and remain unbeaten. At this point, they have head-to-head -head wins over all three of their division rivals, all of whom have lost at least four games while combining for fewer wins than the Vikes have by themselves. And while few teams have ever had as strong a stranglehold on a division through seven weeks than the 6-0 Vikings have over their 5-14 NFC North brethren, it's not just their division. They're in fact lording over the entire conference right now. But these are the Minnesota Vikings we're talking about, so they immediately tumble from their cliff perched well above the rest of the conference, dropping six of their next eight games, before somehow clobbering a 12-2 Chiefs team in Week 16. The only thing consistent about this team is Moss's production, who in November tops 1,200 receiving yards, going 6-for-6 six six to start his career. 
Heading into the 17th and final week, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is, despite the 6-0 start, they've yet to clinch anything as they and the Packers both sit at 9-6. The Vikings are very much fighting for their playoff lives in the last game of the season. The good news is that they hold the tiebreaker, so a win will secure a division title, and eight days after dismantling the league's best team, barely ever has there been a friendlier foe to face. Entering today, the Arizona Cardinals are the absolute dregs of the league. Their offense has scored the fewest points and their defense has allowed the most, good for a point differential nearly 100 points worse than anyone else. Throughout the annals of NFL history, it takes a special team in a special season to drop south of negative 225, but the 2003 Cards have done it. One of the worst single season teams ever. And here they are, served up on a silver platter for Minnesota, all teed up for the Vikings to destroy to cap their whirlwind regular season with a division title and home playoff game, where at that point, anything can happen. The Vikings send their fans into panic mode in the first half after allowing the NFL's worst defense to completely shut them out. The situation soon normalizes though, with the Vikings rebounding to build an 11 point lead late in the fourth. Even when quarterback Josh McCown finally leads the cards on a late touchdown drive to cut the lead to five, they're set to kick it away inside two minutes with only one timeout remaining. No choice left but to kick onside. Neil Rackers perfectly executes it, popping the ball sky high, and the Vikings' Jim Kleinsaucer knocks it to a cardinal. Oh boy. A 30-yard pass interference, a couple McCown completions, and a 4-yard Emmett Smith carry with a minute left move the ball inside Minnesota's 10. That's when the Fox Sports Chiron drops in with the worst possible news from Green Bay. The Packers have put the Broncos away. In other words, the Vikings' potential safety net has vanished. The scenario for the Vikings becomes crystal clear. Get a stop, play football at home in January, surrender a touchdown, go ice fishing in January. The Vikes are up shit creek. Then their pass rush hands them a paddle. Kevin Williams, who's already picked McCown and sacked him twice, gets him a third time to bring up a third and 14 and force the cards to use their last time out. Then it's Lance Johnstone coming through with the sack and strip. Arizona recovers, but the clock is running under 25 seconds. They can't spike it because it's fourth down. They can't call timeout because they don't have any timeouts. So all they can do is frantically line up to run one last play, needing a touchdown from 28 yards out as the final seconds tick away. McCown takes the snap, rolls right, and fires a strike toward the back corner of the end zone where Nate Poole soars above multiple Vikings to miraculously pluck the ball out of the air and, while he doesn't get both feet down, is ruled to have been forced out of bounds, resulting in a game-winning score and a heart-wrenching, season-ending collapse by the Minnesota Vikings, best captured by the eloquent words of Paul Allen, their beloved radio play-by-play -play voice. Touchdown! No! No! The Cardinals have knocked the Vikings out of the playoffs! It's about the most twisted, agonizing way a team could miss the playoffs. This game was such an intense roller coaster, from not scoring until well into the second half, to storming back to not just take the lead, but a two-score lead at the two-minute warning, to allowing the Cardinals within nine yards of a game-winning touchdown, to back-to-back -to -back sacks forcing a desperate last-second prayer, to Arizona seeing that prayer get answered, that if I were a Vikings fan, I wouldn't have been able to keep my lunch down. This season was such an intense roller coaster, from a 6-0 start as the class of the conference, to then losing six of their next eight, to then crushing the league's best team, to then losing to one of the worst teams ever to miss the playoffs after said 6-0 start, that evil Knievel wouldn't have been able to keep his lunch down. The man who caught the touchdown that ended the Vikings season was a college teammate of Randy Moss, and he pulled off the impersonation to perfection after preparing for this moment all week. Moss, again, was the metrodome metronome in a season otherwise marred by a complete lack of consistency all around him. With another monster year, Moss is now up to nearly 8,400 career receiving yards and 77 touchdowns. 
Even with the passing explosion in the decades to come, as of 2023, he remains the most prolific receiver of all time through six career seasons, and the Vikings completely squandered his best of the six. Congratulations to the New England Patriots winners of Super Bowl 38. This is their second Super Bowl win. During the 1997 playoffs, the Vikings had sent in offensive lineman Bob Sapp for a few snaps. Shortly thereafter, Sapp left football and embarked on a very long and notorious career in pro wrestling and MMA. So there is at least a little bit of precedent for this. The summer before the 2004 season, the Vikings signed area resident and recent WWE champion Brock Lesnar in the hopes he'll be able to hack it as a defensive lineman. Having never played college football, Lesnar is pretty much the exact opposite of Alan Page. An enormous size, zero technique. His ability to understand and play the position are very much in question, but his size, strength, and competitiveness are definitely not. At one point during a scrimmage against the Chiefs, Lesnar starts a fight by absolutely annihilating quarterback Damon Heward. And although he's cut from the roster by the end of training camp, he actually played well enough to be taken seriously despite still recovering from a recent motorcycle accident. Could he really have immediately brute forced his way into the NFL at a position that demands impeccable technique and many years of coaching? It sounds stupid, but then again, a few years from now he'll join the UFC, piss off a subset of purist MMA fans who are especially sensitive to any associations with pro wrestling, and then really, really piss him off when he actually wins the UFC heavyweight title. So, who knows? Instead, 2004 will be known as the year of Dante Culpepper, who walks away from this season feeling like a Jedi. And if you experience the 2004 he does, you would too. Whenever you get to throw to Randy Moss, there's sort of a little invisible asterisk next to whatever numbers you happen to put up. Yeah, great numbers, but you got to throw to Superman. As you'd expect, across Culpepper's first four seasons as starter, he leaned heavy on Moss, who accounted for more than a third of his passing yardage. In 2004, Moss was hampered by injuries and his production plummeted. Culpepper simply turned to second-year receiver Nate Burleson and said, okay, now you're the guy. Then he looked at journeyman Jermaine Wiggins and Marcus Robinson and said, you two are going to have the best years of your careers because you are catching passes from me. It's with these receiving targets that Dante Culpepper assembles one of the best quarterback seasons ever seen. This season, Culpepper finishes with 8.02 adjusted net yards per pass attempt. He sustained that average over a sample of more than 500 pass attempts. After 1984 Dan Marino, he's only the second quarterback in NFL history to ever do that. And although many other quarterbacks will soon join them in this club, they serve only to demonstrate that if you have a quarterback who's dealing at this astronomical level, you should be winning lots of games. Any fewer than 12 or 13 would be a disappointment. So, where are we? The x-axis is the year, right? What year are we in? 2004? Ah, dang it. Eight wins? Your quarterback is playing like a Jedi and you have eight wins? Last year, the Vikings started 6-0 and then collapsed. Now they've started 5-1 and collapsed again, finishing 8-8. Culpepper is making history and they are wasting it. Unsurprisingly, this puts Mike Tice right on the hot seat. It's during this slide that Red McCombs, as he'll later reveal, seriously considers firing Tice midseason before ultimately resolving to keep him in place. What McCombs doesn't say... What won't be revealed until years later, and what many Vikings might not know to this day, is who exactly he intended to be his replacement. At some point during the season, Red McCombs picks up the phone and says, Hey, uh, bud, what you doing? Our source here is chapter 16 of Bud Grant's autobiography, which begins, I have never told this story to anyone. We need to sidestep a chronological inconsistency here. Bud and his co-author write that this conversation occurred in 2005, whereas all the surrounding details clearly indicate it went down in 2004. Regardless, Bud says the same thing he originally said in 1984 when they wanted him to replace Les Steckel. You already have a coach, and I am not going to do that to him. So McCombs calls Bud again and says, Okay, listen, the deal's done. We're going to fire Tice after the Detroit game. Bud says, I'll think about it. 
We believe this is probably the Week 15 game in which the Vikings squeak out a 28-27 win, leading Bud to reconsider. You can't fire a guy after a win like that. I can't do this. McCombs is still adamant about showing Tice the door, and that's when they really start talking about it. Bud explains that he'll really just need to serve as a figurehead to finish out this season and will hold off on making any major changes until 2005. One being, interesting enough, that he'll bring none other than Jerry Burns out of retirement and reinstall him as offensive coordinator. Things progress so far that the team actually schedules a press conference to announce the bombshell that will astound and delight everybody in the state of Minnesota. Bud Grant, the legend, the lion in winter, is returning to the throne. And then they start talking money. McCombs offers him Mike Tice's salary, which is the lowest head coach salary in the NFL. Now remember, this is the same Bud Grant who once got so up in arms about coaches' salaries that he put the fear of God into NFL brass by threatening to form a coaches' union. He is no sucker. You are going to have to pay him what he's worth. A friend recalls that Bud tells McCombs, You better look me up in the blue book. Last time I talked with the Vikings, they offered me the highest salary in the NFL. That is the price. McCombs doesn't budge. It doesn't happen. Bud says no thank you and goes right back to sitting in his duck blind, and a difference of a couple million dollars is the one and only reason why. Bud emphasizes that he was completely serious about coming back. Again, in 2004, at age 77, which would have made him the oldest coach in NFL history, how would that have gone? I've spent a long time trying to imagine it, and I have no idea. Back in the real world, it turns out that in 2004, 8-8 is just barely good enough to make the playoffs. It's here that they meet the Green Bay Packers and their future Hall of Fame quarterback, Brett Favre. Although the two teams have been division rivals throughout the Vikings' entire existence, this is their first ever postseason encounter. After winning Super Bowls I and II, the Packers disappeared into the middle of the group in the 70s and 80s. The resurgence, which began in 1992, lines up perfectly with the arrival of Favre, who won three straight MVPs in the 90s and led them to a couple of Super Bowls, one of which they won. Favre has already beaten the Vikings twice this season. To Vikings fans, who have watched this guy shoot past their team to the division title year after year, Favre has cemented his status as public enemy number one. For the Vikings, things seem inherently bleak from the jump. The scars of the 2000 NFC Championship game have apparently ruined their ability to play outside, which certainly doesn't bode well for this game at freezing Lambeau Field. But on the third play of the game, Packers linebacker Nick Barnett tries to prevent Dante Culpepper from running for a first down and in so doing abandons his coverage of Mo Williams. An easy completion and one broken tackle later, he's off to the races for a 68-yard touchdown. Their defense forces a quick three and out, and after the offense efficiently moves downfield to Green Bay's 20, Culpepper gives Moss a chance with a pass between two DBs in the end zone that Randy beautifully adjusts to as the Vikes are already up 14 just five minutes into the game. Brett Favre's next pass is off target and intercepted by Antoine Winfield, which leads to a Minnesota field goal. They're now up three scores before allowing three passing yards, or a first down. For Moss and longtime offensive lineman David Dixon and Matt Burke, this joins the 98 divisional round beatdown over Arizona as their second such playoff game. In the second quarter, the Packers have the ball after whittling the Viking lead down to just seven, but some miscommunication results in another Favre pick, and two plays later, Culpepper plays an easy game of pitch and catch with Nate Burleson to take a 24 to 10 lead. Green Bay threatens to answer with a touchdown of their own when they reach Minnesota's 8-yard line, but there's this thing in football called a line of scrimmage, which is an imaginary line parallel to the goal lines that extend from where the football is placed at the start of a play out to either sideline. Quarterbacks are no longer allowed to throw a forward pass once their entire body and the ball have crossed it. They're almost always very well aware of this line and their body's relation to it. Sometimes they do get awfully close to it before throwing, once in a while, they'll indeed go fully beyond it by a very small margin, perhaps an inch or two, maybe even a foot or so if they're being really reckless, before unloading a pass. Then we have Brett Favre on this third down right here, who spins out of pressure and starts to scramble. He approaches the 8-yard line and then crosses the Rubicon. He is now fully committed to using his legs to try and pick up a first down, and it looks like he should at least get very close to doing so. He chugs forward a full yard past the line of scrimmage, then two, then three, then four, 
And now he slings a little sidearm pass into the end zone. Sorry, Brett. It was so close, too. The football gods are unamused by these shenanigans as the Packers' subsequent chip shot field goal attempt is wide left to keep the Viking lead at 14 going into the half. The third quarter doesn't provide any scoring, though it does provide Favre's third pick of the game, and then his fourth pick of the game. But with Minnesota unable to capitalize, Green Bay's still hanging around, and early in the fourth quarter, they finish off a drive with a one-yard touchdown to get back within seven. When the Vikings get the ball back, they move down to the Packers' 34, where they have a run play called. Culpepper recognizes an all-out blitz coming and audibles to a pass play, signaling for Moss to go deep. Linebacker Hannibal Navies fails to do his job, which leaves cornerback Al Harris totally vulnerable when he sits on the first leg of Moss's slant and go, as he should on a play call that's designed to force an ultra-quick throw. So when Moss unleashes his double move, which aren't supposed to work against all-out blitzes, Harris is woefully out of position thanks to the bust, which enables Culpepper enough time to easily loft what turns into the game-clinching touchdown by Randy Moss, who then, God forbid, decides to have some fun. He celebrates his touchdown by pretending, I repeat, pretending, to pull down his pants and moon the Lambeau crowd. There are so many potential adjectives to describe this act. Funny, harmless, entertaining, playful, amusing, certainly reciprocatory. Let's check in on the adjective of choice for broadcaster Joe Buck. That is a disgusting act by Randy Moss. And it's unfortunate that we had that on our air live. That is disgusting by Randy Moss. And it's not just Buck. A host of Fox colleagues voiced similar thoughts, either not realizing or not caring about what prompted it. Packer fans' long-standing tradition of dishing bare-ass moons out to visiting teams. Daryl Johnston even goes as far to say the league should suspend him for the next round of the playoffs. Great idea, Moose. That seems totally justified. Anyway, the next week, Moss and the Vikings travel to Philadelphia to take on the top-seeded Eagles. Phillies without first-team All-Pro wide receiver Terrell Owens, who's rehabbing leg and ankle injuries, so that means an elevated role for number three wideout Freddie Mitchell. And Mitchell stakes his team to a 7-0 lead with a first-quarter touchdown that he celebrates by engaging in a... gusting act. On their next drive, quarterback Donovan McNabb connects on an explosive pass to Greg Lewis, and two plays later, coach Andy Reid schemes up a one-on-one -on -one matchup to get star running back Brian Westbrook isolated in space on a linebacker, which is game over. Dante Culpepper responds by launching a missile of his own downfield, which gets the Vikes into the red zone, where he finishes the drive by barreling over three eagles for the touchdown. Philly quickly moves into the red zone themselves thanks to back-to-back -back pass interference penalties, and McNabb hits an open LJ Smith over the middle who's about to set up a first and goal when finally Minnesota gets a break. Antoine Winfield closes in to make the tackle, and his helmet pops the ball loose, sending it flying forward and right into the waiting arms of Freddie Mitchell in the end zone. After four years in Philly in which he'd only scored once in front of his home crowd, this is his second touchdown in the first half today. The Vikings then advance all the way to the Eagles' three, where the drive stalls and they send out their field goal unit, intending to run a fake in which Moss feigns jogging off the field before stopping just shy of the sideline, where he's all by himself for an impending walk-in touchdown. Just one tiny complication, though. Reserve lineman Corey Withrow never gets the memo, and when frenetic efforts to get him off the field fail, they have to resort to yanking Moss off. With Mike Tice's desperate pleas for a timeout unheeded, older Gus Farratt takes the snap, looks to throw to his left, realizes he has no one to his left to throw to, and ultimately just chucks it out of the end zone. No seven points. Not even three points. Still down 14 in the third quarter, Culpepper throws an ugly pick to Jeremiah Trotter, and the Eagles cash that in for a 31-yard touchdown to... who else? Freddie Mitchell. This is now his third today. Except Mike Tice challenges the ruling, and upon further review, it's confirmed that Mitchell lost control of the ball before breaking the plane, where it then hits the pylon. A fumble touchback. Another of everyone's favorite play. Unfortunately for the Vikings, it doesn't matter. They're unable to put any second half points on the board until garbage time as they fall by 13. 
Congratulations to the New England Patriots winners of Super Bowl 39. This is their third Super Bowl win. Not long after, the Vikings trade Randy Moss to the Raiders for linebacker Napoleon Harris and a handful of draft picks that don't amount to all that much. It's probably best for everybody. Randy had long been unhappy with the organization's unwillingness to spend money, hovering tens of millions of dollars under the salary cap instead of shoring up a defense that was one of the league's worst, year after year. The plan, it seemed, was simply for the electrifying Culpepper to Moss offense to pick up the slack. It's fun to imagine what this era's Vikings could have accomplished had Red McCombs been a little bit more willing to spend. Moss will become a future Hall of Famer, as well as a TV personality, and a great one. For now, he leaves Minnesota with one final batch of antics that beautifully demonstrate just how different things are in 2004 than the way they used to be. There was, of course, the disgusting act, the pretend mooning of Packers fans, which again was a response to them actually mooning him. But remember back in 74 when Fran Tarkenton straight up spiked a ball off a guy's helmet? If either of these are offensive, wouldn't it be that one? But when Tarkenton did that, nobody gave a shit. There was also the final game of this 2004 regular season, a loss to Washington. The game was functionally over, but with two seconds left, it wasn't technically over when Moss walked off to the locker room. Was that in poor taste? I guess so, but remember the Hail Mary playoff game in 1975? Well, Alan Page and Carl Eller did the exact same thing when that game was a lot less over. Again, when they did that, nobody gave a shit. It seems like these Randy antics would have gone largely unnoticed back then. Had he carried him out today, the news cycle turns over so quickly now that we'd probably all let it go in a day and a half. The climate was unique during those years, in ways that I don't think we've fully taken stock of yet, but that's a story for another time. Although Randy did have some defenders in the media, people more often than not relished in reading off litanies of every real or imagined sin he ever committed. From things he actually really shouldn't have done, to smoking marijuana to responding to the Fuhrer over his pretend mooning with, quote, next time I might shake my dick, a line that's at least as funny as the iconic line he dropped just seconds prior. A CARE 11 producer catches Moss getting into his car and asks him if he's written the check yet for his $10,000 fine. He says, when you're rich, you don't write checks. The producer then asks, well, then how do you pay? And then, obscured by the backlight of the winter Minnesota sunset, he'll soon leave for California, Without an instant of hesitation, he drops one of the signature lines of the 21st century. If you don't write checks, how do you pay these guys? Great cash, homie. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Tice has a plan. As an NFL head coach, the league allows him to purchase a handful of tickets for the upcoming Super Bowl for five or six hundred bucks a piece. So he's going to buy some, turn around, and flip them for nineteen hundred bucks. If he sells, say, half a dozen tickets, that's seven or eight thousand bucks in profit. Pretty sweet. Is it against the rules? Yeah, but everybody all over the NFL does this. Just be cool about it, all right? He's the lowest paid coach in the league. He's got to get in on this action. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, somebody picks up the phone to snitch on him, and him specifically, and it sounds like a big fine is on the way. Come on, what'd Mike ever do to anybody? Oh well, hopefully the fine isn't too big. A hundred thousand dollars? Ah, dang it. Tice manages to hang on to his job, but he's probably well aware he's on thin ice. After just seven years of ownership, Red McCombs has given up on his quest to secure a new stadium to replace the Metrodome, and along with it, any interest in owning the team. In steps a new ownership group led by Ziggy Wilf, who didn't hire Tice and likely has no compunctions about firing him. So Tice's top priority in 2005 is to restore order. With all the Randy Moss-related disruptions in the rear view, the Vikings need to hunker down, keep the focus on football, and eliminate off-the-field distra- Ah, dang it. What you've just read is eight pages of complaints against Dante Culpepper, Fred Smoot, Brian McKinney, and Mo Williams, four of 17 Vikings players alleged to have rented out two houseboats on nearby Lake Minnetonka, flown in sex workers from Atlanta and Florida via an escort service, and engaged in a wide variety of sexual acts that, while consensual, were absolutely not what any of the employees on the houseboat signed up to see. It earns about as many headlines as anything Randy Moss ever did combined, 
It serves as late night talk show fodder for months, and it goes down in history as one of the very biggest off the field team distractions in the history of sports. Eventually, McKinney and Smoot plead guilty to misdemeanors, Williams is convicted of disorderly conduct, and charges against Culpepper are dropped entirely. It's convenient, but probably not accurate, to try to pin Culpepper's regression on this episode. In 2005, you'd never know his 2004 ever happened at all. His majestic eight adjusted net yards per pass attempt are cut in half. Both before and after the boat party, he's been standing in the pocket for way too long and throwing way too many picks. It's likely a domino effect that begins with a sprained MCL and a case of bursitis he's been fighting through. His agility and mobility are compromised, and that chips away at his confidence, which leads to him throwing less decisively, which snowballs into his confidence eroding further. During week eight, Culpepper suffers a season-ending knee injury. After the 38-13 loss, he leaves the locker room on crutches, crying. And that was the last time we'll ever see him in a Minnesota Vikings uniform. After the season, a contract dispute and a disagreement over where and how to rehabilitate his injury result in a trade to the Dolphins, but it's not the fresh start he hoped for. He'll display occasional sparks of his old football self there, in Oakland, and in Detroit, but an endless string of injuries will keep him from ever returning to form. Dante Culpepper's career remains one of the great what-ifs among NFL fans, us included, but in doing so, we miss the point. His story is the answer to a far more astonishing what-if. What if a kid who is born in prison can overcome everything that's been stacked against him? What if he chooses a small-time program instead of all the elite programs that are knocking on his door, puts that program on the map, becomes NFL teammates with his childhood idol, and finally pieces together the most omnidirectionally great season seen from the quarterback position to that point? Maybe if things had gone a little bit differently, he could have won a Super Bowl. It wouldn't have been necessary. This is already a total victory. After starting 1-4, Mike Tice and the Vikings complete the rally all the way back to 9-7 with a decisive 34-10 win over the Bears. It's not quite good enough to make the playoffs, but it's a validating payoff of all the work they did to turn this season around, and it provides some momentum to take into the next season. Mike Tyson, excuse me, Mike Tice's son is a team ball boy. After the game, someone hands him a press release. Hmm, what's it say? Ah, dang it. The Tice years were unlike any other Vikings era. There was the historic draft debacle, the Randy Moss traffic incident, the second historic draft debacle, the jaw-dropping 2003 collapse, the jaw-dropping 2004 collapse, the owner's secret plot to fire him mid-season, the boat party, the ticket scalping. Were some of those things on him? Sure. But have you happened to notice that within this entire Super Bowl era, the Vikings have never filed three consecutive losing seasons? They're literally the only team that hasn't done that. It's a run that began with Bud, later saved when Bud returned, preserved by Burns, and carried into the next century by Green. It was here when a prolonged retreat would not have surprised anybody, but they did not retreat. Despite everything, Mike Tice didn't let it happen. Congratulations to the Pittsburgh Steelers winners of Super Bowl XL. This is their fifth Super Bowl win. Replacing Tice in 2006 is Brad Childress, the Eagles' outgoing offensive coordinator who's taken the top job for the first time in his 28 years of coaching. He's never been the guy in front of the mic, and it shows during his introductory press conference. He starts talking, but nobody can really hear him. Finally, Bud Grant, who's up there next to him, leans over and says, Hey, you're standing like two feet away from the mic. Scooch up. As Star Tribune columnist Jim Suhan writes the next day, Our people are getting a fresh coat of beige. For the first time ever, the Minnesota Vikings have a head coach who generally fades into the background rather than stealing the show. He is not Norm Van Brocklin, Bud Grant, Les Steckel, Jerry Burns, Dennis Green, or Mike Tice. He is Brad. And he is the bringer of the 2006 season, the first truly boring season the Vikings have ever had. That other mystery Viking we promised you back in the 90s, he's not quite here yet. Instead, we're treated to a rerun, with former quarterback Brad Johnson having won a Super Bowl with the Bucks, returning to start for the Vikings at age 37. He leads an offense missing any of the sorts of playmakers Vikings fans are used to, and they finish 6-10. Thankfully, there was still one man determined to represent the state of Minnesota. Congratulations to Prince, winner of Super Bowl XLI. This is his first Super Bowl win. 
On the field, this was one of the less memorable Super Bowls. Devin Hester returned the opening kickoff for a touchdown, then it settled into a slog as the Bears and Colts combined to commit eight turnovers. Neither offense scored a single touchdown in the second half. By that point, Prince Rogers Nelson had already used up all the fireworks. Bud Grant had always seen something fundamentally artificial about the Super Bowl, as though it was something different from the football his team had spent all season playing. Some dismissed that as a cop-out and excuse why he never won one, but as more money poured in, as it became the culture-swallowing institution it is today, the entire experience has become fake. Ticket prices average 9000 bucks, ensuring that most people there are there because they are somebody or know somebody. The commercials, which used to give us our annual stockpile of memes pre-internet, are all nodding and winking and self-aware and beyond unbearable now. The halftime show is sometimes cool, sometimes not that cool, but regardless, the performance and performer are reduced to subjects of scrutiny, everybody just staring and waiting for everything to go wrong. Prince's Super Bowl halftime show is not only the greatest of all time by an order of magnitude, it transcended all the fakeness surrounding it. He jumped right through the television in a way I have never seen anybody else do. I think it was during his Let's Go Crazy guitar solo that everybody at the Super Bowl party I was at stopped what they were doing. Everyone stopped talking. I've never been much more than a casual Prince fan, and I don't know whether anybody else was there either. Didn't matter. We were glued. It lasted 12 minutes and it's one of the greatest things I have ever seen. After too many years of being ruthlessly DMCA'd off the internet, the entire show is now viewable on YouTube. Listen, you can pause this and go watch that if you want. No, really. I, I won't be offended. The famously philanthropic Prince has graciously elected to donate his Super Bowl win to the Indianapolis Colts. This is now that franchise's second Super Bowl win. It's 1983. Nelson Peterson is a point guard at Lawn Morris College in Jacksonville, Texas. Nelson is a unicorn, a slightly oversized 6'4 point guard who can drill shots from 25 feet out and also has the athleticism to dunk on fast breaks. In fact, his coach insists that he has the potential to become the best guard he has ever seen. Nelson is all set to transfer to Oklahoma, but he plans to get married and the Sooners refuse to provide accommodations for his partner. Having already committed to Oklahoma, other schools hadn't recruited him, so he heads for the relatively small-time Idaho State program. He emerges as one of the top players in the Big Sky Conference and attracts interest from the NBA, but his future in basketball ends suddenly when his brother accidentally shoots him in the leg while cleaning a gun. Nelson, who planned on making millions, now works at Walmart, where he still plans on making millions. It's out of a Walmart warehouse where he orchestrates a cocaine distribution ring that generates about four million bucks. Nelson keeps it professional, he considers himself a wholesaler and prefers to keep his operation quiet. But in 1998, that operation is exposed and he's sentenced to 10 years in prison after pleading guilty to money laundering. On the phone and through the mail, Nelson is determined to be the best father the circumstances allow him to be for his son, Adrian. Nelson's son has persevered through the unthinkable tragedy of seeing his brother, Brian, fatally struck by a drunk driver when he was just seven years old, then transcended numerous obstacles to become a superstar East Texas high school football player. Before he even graduates, some insist he has the potential to become the best running back ever seen. It's the same thing they said about his father, whose one-time dream he fulfills by playing for Oklahoma, albeit in a different sport. There he achieves national stardom and very nearly becomes the first freshman ever to win the Heisman Trophy. In 2007, the Vikings select him with the seventh overall pick. Adrian Peterson's objective is a simple one. He wants to be the greatest football player in history. In just his fifth career NFL game, he rushes for 224 yards. That breaks the Vikings' all-time single game record for rushing yards. In this same game, he also returns four kicks for 128 yards. In so doing, Peterson totals a staggering 361 all-purpose yards, which to this day, no other player at any position has ever done this century. Again, that is his fifth career game. Astonishing, especially astonishing because nobody ever really talks about it. What people talk about instead is what he does three weeks later in his eighth career game.
through the first nine minutes and change, Peterson's number has only been called once for a two-yard carry, leaving him a little under 0.7% of the way to single-game running back immortality. The 2.95 football fields Ravens running back Jamal Lewis ate up in a 2003 game. He's currently on track to finish with about 12.7 rushing yards today, a total good for 4.3% of Lewis's all-time mark. Then he gets his second tote, and he hurdles over a Chargers linebacker on a highlight reel five-yard rush. Two plays later, his speed around the corner creates his first big gain of the afternoon to set the Vikes up inside San Diego's five, and he charges into the end zone on his next carry as Minnesota ties the game at seven. Another couple one-yard pickups bring the first quarter to a close, and his first three carries of the second quarter combine to generate zero yardage, so far resulting in a tough day at the office. Nine carries, three yards a pop, and the game is now 42% over, while Peterson remains stuck at 9% of the way up the mountain. Then Peterson burrows his way inside for five tough yards, followed by another seven. On a second and three, the Chargers shoot the gap for a loss to make third down tougher, but Peterson does pick it up on a six-yard carry. Key conversion, too. It allows the Vikes to wind up moving the ball another 30 yards downfield to set up a last-second 57-yard field goal attempt. Ryan Longwell comes up just short, and right there on the other end of the rainbow is Antonio Cromartie to make an acrobatic snag about 109 yards, 2 feet, and 10 inches away from where he'd currently like to go. There is an incredible lack of speed among the 11 Vikings on the field, and certainly no one who can move anything like Cromartie, who with relative ease is able to turn the corner, sprint along the sideline ahead of 10 of them, and with a convoy of blockers, punter Chris Cluey is shockingly unable to prevent a stroll into the end zone for the NFL's first ever 109-yard touchdown. Celebrating a record that can only be tied but never broken, Cromartie busts out a little Deion Sanders dance as the the Chargers grab a 14-7 lead at the half. 50% in the books, less than 15% of the way to the single-game gold standard for running backs. He gets going in the second half by turning a play that's blocked for about two into six. Then we see Peterson really get loose, bursting through a narrow opening on the left side for about 15 yards before shrugging off one tackle attempt and taking it the distance for a 64-yard touchdown to once again tie the game. On his next carry, he lowers his shoulder to finish a five-yard run with authority before he slips and loses a couple. Their following possession, the Vikes feed Peterson on each of their first three plays, and he gains six on the first, bounces off heavy traffic at the line of scrimmage to pick up ten on the second, and on the third, patiently waits for his blocking to develop before accelerating through for 13 yards. He gets a one-play respite before another five-yard gain moves the chains for his third straight first down this drive. Fully in a groove, Peterson's presence draws an eighth charger into the box, which helps unlock a 40-yard touchdown catch by fellow rookie Sidney Rice. The Vikes' final third-quarter possession gives them the lead, and an enormous 107-yard third quarter boosts Peterson's rushing total up to an even buck 50 for the game. About where he should have been at halftime instead of going into the fourth quarter if he wants to usurp Lewis, but that third quarter was still prolific enough to now render him on pace for exactly 200 yards. That's a number so high, some seasons no one ever reaches it. A number so high, all-time rushing king Emmett Smith reached it just once in his entire 15-year career. So considering how lackluster Peterson's 43-yard first half was, that's a pretty Herculean third quarter for him to now be on that sort of pace. He's barely halfway to Lewis, but at least 200 seems very much in play. And remember, he did that just three weeks ago, too. Can he get those 50 remaining yards to reach two Bills for a second time after just eight career games, something not even Emmett Smith did in a decade and a half? On to quarter four. When the Vikings get it back after a Chargers field goal, they immediately give Peterson the ball, and despite the officials' best efforts, he's still able to get 16 yards. The next play he refuses to go down after a short gain and turns it into a long gain of 19 yards. A little under two minutes into the fourth, and he's up to 185 yards. 
His next two carries are good for eight more, and the one after that starts off poorly as he runs into Matt Burke's back, but he bounces off, changes directions, and finds some space to run that catapults him over 200. When he gets wrapped up, he continues to fight for every last possible inch, at which point the play once more turns sour when the ball gets knocked free, victimized by his own relentless effort. He couldn't atone quicker for that mishap though, and in case you're wondering if he's got bigger sights than that second career 200 yard game he's already bagged, he answers that question on the next Viking snap when some beautiful blocking springs him into open field. From there, his wheels do the rest of the work in reaching another gear where no Chargers got a prayer of catching him on a 46 yard game ceiling touchdown. Up to 251. All of a sudden, this is very realistic. He's 85% of the way there, and when Minnesota gets the ball back exactly midway through the final quarter, the game is 87.5% over. San Diego knows what's coming and hits Peterson after a gain of about three, and he drags half the Charger defense another four yards. He's given a breather so that backup Chester Taylor can carry the ball on every play for the rest of an insurance touchdown drive, and while it looks like his day might be over after 258 yards, just after the two minute warning, the Vikings get the ball one last time. But he's still 37 yards away, and on carry number 29, Peterson doesn't look like he has much there when Antonio Cromartie meets him in the hole but a lightning quick outside cut leaves Cromarty grasping at air and he comes within a whisker of blowing the roof off the Metrodome with a 90 yard touchdown. But after an illegal horse collar tackle 35 yards later, Peterson is just two yards shy of Lewis. And then, 72 inches short of immortality, Brad Childress removes him from the game. 99.3% of the way to the summit, in the closing moments, it's, hey Chester, you take this one. With a minute left, the Vikings only need to run two more plays before this game's a wrap. Peterson goes back in. He's handed the ball a 30th and final time, and he churns his legs forward for exactly three yards. 296. Adrian Peterson has become the National Football League's all time single game rushing champion. Unsurprisingly, Peterson wins the 2007 Rookie of the Year award in a nearly unanimous vote, which makes the Vikings 8-8 record go down just a little bit easier. Congratulations to the New England... Um, sorry. Congratulations to the New York Giants winners of Super Bowl 42. This is their third Super Bowl win. 2008 is finally Tavares Jackson's chance to run this offense. It's been a long way for the third-year quarterback, who Brad Childress sees as a high upside project, a guy with exceptional talent who he believes just needs more development and experience. They bring in 37-year-old journeyman Gus Farratt to mentor him as a backup, but after two rough outings to start the season, Childress actually ends up benching Jackson in favor of Farratt, who, after bringing the Vikings to 7-5, is lost to injury during their Week 14 game against Detroit. And it's here that Jackson gets another chance to prove he's their quarterback of the future. And poetically enough, he steps in against Detroit quarterback Dante Culpepper, who, of course, once held that title himself in Minnesota. In the fourth quarter, Jackson rolls right and finds tight end Vasante Shanko for the game-winning score in what will easily prove to be Shanko's second most interesting moment of the day. It's a signature win that earns a locker room visit from owner Ziggy Wilf. This screenshot from the Fox Sports broadcast has become an iconic image in Vikings lore. Throughout the years, this franchise has experienced a lot of turmoil in the ownership ranks, and it's such a breath of fresh air to see the owner in the locker room celebrating a win with his players. On this day, and for years to follow, NFL fans shared this screenshot all over the internet. We were all just so inspired by Wilf's singular leadership of this franchise. It's just an unforgettable image that offers a window into the culture of a truly special organization. Jackson continues to play well down the stretch with the Vikings winning three of their last four to finish 10-6 and, and lock in their first NFC North title since the division was founded in 2002. It's here when he meets the Eagles in the wildcard round and against one of the league's top defenses, they just can't make it happen. Despite two touchdowns from Adrian Peterson in his playoff debut, the Vikings fall 26-14. Congratulations to the Pittsburgh Steelers, winners of Super Bowl 43. This is their sixth 
Super Bowl win. Anyway, just like that, the Vikings have created an eight-year stretch in which they've only won one single playoff game, and even that one was almost a freebie anyway, a victory against a 35-year-old past his prime Brett Favre who spotted him four interceptions in a performance so embarrassing that he started talking about retirement immediately after the game. That gimme aside, nothing. You know, one thing we've really come to appreciate about these Minnesota Vikings is that they have not only an incredible flourish for storytelling, but a refined sense of pace and timing. Each decade is a neatly contained chapter. First they're stuck in some kind of morass, then a transformational figure arrives from out of nowhere, and then they storm the gates, every time. In the aughts, it's safe to say they check the morass part off their list in thrilling fashion, with enough debacles to last a lifetime, be they on the field, off the field, in the draft room, in a car, on a car, on a boat, wherever. Adrian Peterson sort of works as a surprise transformational figure, although he's missing the surprise part because we all knew he was incredible the day he was drafted. And it's just so hard to see this 2009 quarterback competition between Tavares Jackson and the incoming Sage Rosenfels, who's spent his entire eight-year career as a backup, and feel like these guys are going to storm anybody's gates before the decade's over. But these are the Minnesota Vikings, the greatest storytellers in football. I know it's late, but uh, want to hear a story? We're in 2009. Want to know what five years ago was? 2004, the season the Vikings took the Packers behind their own woodshed and smacked them silly in the playoffs, prompting Brett Favre in the first few minutes of their 2005 offseason to first seriously contemplate calling it a career in the aftermath of his miserable four interception disaster four years ago. A couple months later, he decides to come back, but to prepare for his impending exit, the Packers select his heir apparent in the first round of the 2005 draft. As the curtain closes on a terrible 29 interception 4-12 season, Favre's removed a play early so the Lambeau crowd could cheer him on one last time as he again seems to be leaning toward retirement. Rob Domofsky, a longtime Packers reporter as closely connected to the team as anyone, begins his post-game column with, Brett Favre sure looked like a guy who was trying to say goodbye Sunday at Lambeau Field. He then twice directly tells general manager Ted Thompson it's time to quit, but he just needs a month or so to finalize his decision. Four months later, after waffling and leaving the Packers hanging through most of the offseason, he decides in late April to come back, and he has definitively declared the 2006 season to be his swan song, saying, quote, it will be my last. There's no doubt about that. 2006. Three years ago. Okay, so as the 2006 season wraps up, Favre is again removed early from the game and gives an interview afterward which will be telling. Uh, I miss these guys and... Uh, is this it? Um, we'll see, we'll see. Rob Domofsky begins his post-game column of their finale and writes, almost verbatim except for a couple slightly different verb forms and the fact that the game wasn't in Lambo, the exact same sentence. This has to be it. And yet? Oh boy. Sounds like second thoughts. To give him the benefit of the doubt, maybe he just doesn't want to answer that in the moment. Fair enough, but even though he already has said he's made up his mind that without a doubt he won't play beyond 06, he will make a final decision in two weeks. Five weeks later, he has decided. To hell with that ironclad declaration before the season. He's back again. After leading the Packers to a resurgent 13-3 regular season in 2007, Favre makes his 2008 intentions known a couple days before beginning their playoff run. He's going nowhere. It has been confirmed by the governor. After a loss in the NFC Championship game, just kidding, retirement it is. Three weeks later, just kidding a second time. So Packers Brass, embracing his decision to unretire, gets ready to leave owners' meetings early to see Favre and finalize his return. Two days later, just kidding, a third time. In April, he teases number four, and in June, he goes for it with the football version of Patrick Henry's speech. That is immediately followed by number five. And then the sixth and final flip-flop comes on July 8th. Favre has finally decided he's all in. 
But with Green Bay at this point having fully pivoted to Aaron Rodgers and unwilling to reinstall him as starter, Favre demands to be released so he can be free to join any team he wants. The Packers, anticipating the beeline he'd make 300 miles west, refuse to play along, creating a schism between player and team. Favre forces their hand by showing up at training camp, and they trade him to the Jets. One year later, he retires again. And unretires again. Despite another big Favre-related schism, this time in the locker room over which alternative would be best for the team, Brett Favre is the starting quarterback for the 2009 Minnesota Vikings. The guy who's supposed to lead these Vikings to this Super Bowl is going to turn 40 this season. Let's take a look at every single 40-something guy up to this point in history who's ever even thrown a pass in the playoffs, let alone the Super Bowl. A grand total of three guys more than three decades ago. Is Favre a special case? Well, let's ditch the more advanced metrics and stick to passer rating, the one more people are familiar with. In his prime, of course, he was usually far above league average, but he's actually been below average in three of his last four years. And his decline last season sure makes him look like a guy pushing 40 on his way out of the NFL. Supposing he defied all indicators and did somehow get to the playoffs, nothing will get you bounced from the playoffs quicker than throwing interceptions. Through 2008, Favre has thrown more interceptions than any other quarterback in history by a wide margin. Throw in the element of his new teammates reportedly not really being on board with this idea, and the possibility that Favre himself might not really be able to stay on board with this idea, and it's easy to conclude that this may in fact be a really bad idea. Although the Vikings didn't bet the farm to get their guy this time around, it just reeks of the same desperation that pushed him to deal for Herschel Walker 20 years ago. They were only a decade and change removed from their last Super Bowl at the time, and even then, they were desperate to get back there. Distill that desperation for another two entire decades, and this is the bet it all on red bullshit you end up with. You almost want to sit these Vikings down and say, listen, it is okay to fall back and rebuild. I know you've never done that, but every other team does that. You cannot do it like this. Let yourself rest. Just once. This isn't good for you. But then, the strangest thing happens. A 40-year-old Brett Favre has, far and away, the greatest season of his career. In 2009, he throws for more than 4,000 yards and 33 touchdowns, but most astonishing is his ability to take care of the ball. With this guy, this has always been the deal. If you want all his touchdowns, you gotta live with all the interceptions too. You buy the ticket, you ride the ride. Well, this is one of football history's greatest ever hater silencings. He throws just seven picks against more than 500 attempts resulting in the third lowest interception percentage ever across that kind of workload. The man has reinvented himself. We're still at a loss to fully understand how this happened, although it certainly does not hurt to have this man establishing the run. In 2009, Adrian Peterson rushes for nearly 1,400 yards, leads the league in rushing touchdowns, and produces two highlights in particular to let us all know that we are watching one of history's greatest running backs. In week one against the Browns, he scores a touchdown that doesn't really make any sense visually. About 15 yards into his run, it looks like it's over, and it really looks like it's over when he stops, completely flat-footed, heels on the ground, the train has halted, the doors are open, Eric Wright, this is your stop. Even after spotting the Cleveland Browns defense a total deceleration, his acceleration eclipses their top speed. It's a wonder that a man who can run like this is ever caught. We saw a lot of Peterson's signature qualities there, among them his ability to just plain hurt a guy's feelings. Which leads us to week 7. Here he grabs a short one over the middle from Favre, and this time it's his opponent, William Gay, who has his feet planted, ready to swallow him right up. And it's not just that Adrian trucks William into next Thursday, he rolls him out like a carpet, and without really actually meaning to, steps on him on his way to a massive gain and taking the longer view on his way to a 12-4 record that lands the Vikings a first round bye. After each of Brett Favre's first three playoff runs ended at the hands of the Cowboys, he now gets his first crack at postseason revenge in 14 years. 
Dallas is on fire coming into this one, having not even trailed in any of their last four games, but it takes Favre two possessions until he's somehow able to squeeze a pinpoint deep pass right through safety Gerald Sensabaugh, who has yet to even realize the ball has been thrown, and into the hands of Sidney Rice to deal the Cowboys their first deficit in five weeks. The Vikings next time with the ball, they reach the red zone, where Rice's assignment on the play is to cut down Hall of Fame pass rusher DeMarcus Ware, which he does. Then with Favre in trouble and escaping pressure, Rice has the presence of mind to drift into open space down the middle, where Favre finds him for touchdown number two. A couple plays later, Minnesota sack master Jared Allen breezes past tight end Jason Witten, who doesn't have a prayer at blocking him one-on-one, -on -one, strips quarterback Tony Romo to set up a field goal, and the Vikes take a 17-3 lead into the locker room at the half. Midway through the fourth quarter, Favre spots Rice one-on-one -on, -one on the outside with corner Mike Jenkins and gives him a chance to make a play. Despite good coverage, Favre drops it in there just beyond Jenkins' outstretched arm as Rice takes it to the house for the hat trick to put the game away. Shortly thereafter, he damn near becomes the first player to ever catch four TDs in a playoff game, though in garbage time, Favre hits Vasante Shanko to at least secure his first career four-touchdown playoff outing. Combined with a defense that doesn't allow a touchdown, the Vikings absolutely demolish what had been the league's hottest team, 34-3. Favre has the time of his life. He's on top of the world. And after dealing for years with various physical maladies stemming from his old body breaking down, he makes a specific point to note that right now even that's holding up just wonderfully. Led by their fresh and spry quarterback, the Vikings prepare for their opponent in the NFC Championship game. Enduring 33 years without a trip to the Super Bowl is not enough to make you America's darling. Not now, not in 2009, not when you're playing the Saints, just four years after their city was devastated by Hurricane Katrina. Over time, many of us learn how to tune out the prevailing media narratives, but this is one that really cannot be understated or ignored. This team lifted the spirits of people in New Orleans by simply continuing to soldier on like they'd always done. It didn't matter that they'd spent their first couple decades inventing a new category of futility, standing as the NFL's worst team by dramatic margins. Even after recovering somewhat, they belong to the lowest of the low tiers. Couldn't matter less. This team and their city feel so much unwavering solidarity with one another that they may as well be family. We love you Vikings, but those of us who are otherwise unaffiliated are all pulling for the other guys today. A few years from today, we'll all look at this game a little bit differently. In 2012, after a long investigation, the NFL will report its findings that during the 2009 season, Saints defensive coordinator Greg Williams has run a bounty program that, among other things, offered rewards to players who caused injuries that knocked opponents out of the game. This will ultimately result in long suspensions for both Williams and head coach Sean Payton. Clearly, the Saints share the Vikings' desperation to make it to the big one, only theirs runs afoul of both NFL rules and basic decency. The league will find that specifically, linebacker Jonathan Vilma has promised $10,000 to any of his teammates who can knock Brett Favre out of the game. We're about to see some hits on Favre throughout this contest. Watch him closely. Way back in the day, when Favre was a youngster, he developed an undying love for the team he'll now battle for the conference title, as even now he admits he's apparently still got a soft spot in his heart for him. It's possible this changes in a few hours. Having also won his Super Bowl in their Super Dome, Favre dreams of this venue serving as the launch pad for a trip to Miami and Super Bowl 44. On the first play of the game, he throws incomplete while the 40-year-old takes a brutal shot to the back from the blitzing Scott Fujita as Williams' aggressive defense immediately sets their tone of physicality. The old man bounces back from that to move downfield with ease as six consecutive completions get him to the Saints' 25. From there, Adrian Peterson handles business, making a man miss in the backfield before transforming into a locomotive who reaches the end zone in the blink of an eye to give Minnesota the early leg up. But New Orleans has one of the few all-time quarterbacks better than Favre in Drew Brees, someone who will go on to pass for more of everything than Brett, except interceptions. 
and he likewise has little difficulty moving the ball down to Minnesota's 38, where a well-blocked screen to Pierre Thomas is set to pick up about 18, but when linebacker Ben Lieber inexplicably fails to shove Thomas out of bounds, it instead picks up all 38. On the Vikes' next drive, a third down play is blown dead when defensive end Bobby McRae is a bit anxious to get after Favre, but safety Roman Harper remains undeterred from blasting him well after flags are flying and whistles are blowing. Having already taken a couple big shots, Minnesota ensures Favre's safety on a reverse to dynamic rookie Percy Harvin, only to see him still absorb a hellacious, dirty hit from McRae. Later on the same series, he converts a third and seven to Harvin, but it comes at a price, getting walloped yet again. And on third and goal, Sidney Rice finds a hole in the Saint zone, Farr finds Rice, and the Vikes are back in front. The historically woeful Saints, who desperately covet their first ever Super Bowl appearance, will not go quietly, and Breeze directs a game-time drive that he caps with a touchdown to Devery Henderson. Toward the end of the second quarter, Favre hangs tough in the pocket on third and long to deliver a superb pass on the boundary to Bernard Berrien, where he again hits the deck to pick up the first. They eventually punt, but Reggie Bush muffs the return, giving Minnesota a prime chance to take the lead at intermission. But Peterson's a bit sloppy in taking a handoff from Favre, and the ball squirts away into New Orleans' hands to keep the game tied at halftime. To start the second half, the Saints use a long kick return to set up shop on the Viking side of the field, and they quickly march down inside the 10, where Pierre Thomas plows through the heart of Minnesota's defense to score again and give New Orleans their first lead. But in a game predating the automatic review of all scores, no Brad Childress challenge flag means the Saints get away with one, as Thomas, in actuality, was a full yard short. Minnesota is able to respond, though, in what can only be dubbed the Visante Shanko drive, where he reels in a trio of 20-plus yard catches. First, when play action draws every linebacker in, opening acres of real estate in the middle of the field. Then, when Jonathan Vilma's more preoccupied with an underneath route, creating another wide-open opportunity down the middle. And finally, and most spectacularly, while being blatantly held, on a feathery soft toss to the corner that Favre drops right in the bucket as Shanko overcomes the contact to make the juggling catch at the one. Peterson punches in the short TD, and this back and forth game is once again tied. After a Saints punt, the Vikings start their next possession by continuing to feed him, and for the third time today, he's the culprit for a loose ball, though he atones with one of the unlikeliest, most dazzling self-recoveries in football history that actually adds about nine yards to the play. A few snaps later on third down, defensive tackle Anthony Hargrove draws a roughing flag when he lifts Favre off his feet and drives him to the ground while landing with every one of his more than 280 pounds right on top of him. It has clearly rattled him, and this will be the lesser of the two blows he receives this drive. After a completion to Barry and moves the chains, Joe Buck specifically remarks about Favre's resilience. Favre staggered around after that personal foul, and now he's still throwing bullets. I don't know how he keeps getting up and, and going into the huddle and getting up to the line. Then, on his very next pass, he throws a pick while getting completely obliterated by Bobby McRae down low and nose tackle Remy Adele up high. After getting slammed to the turf all game long, Favre was able to at least get up and keep fighting. Now he's down, writhing in pain with a severely damaged left ankle. This is the very first season of a new rule specifically prohibiting low hits on quarterbacks in response to the league having to play the 2008 campaign without its golden boy in the wake of such a hit. Earlier this season, an NFL defensive lineman announced to the world his team will not comply with the new mandate, a defensive lineman who plays for the Saints. And yet, no flag is thrown. The Saints get to keep the ball and the Vikings offense has to leave the field, which Favre cannot do under his own power. On the sidelines, trainers work frantically on his ankle, and amazingly, when Minnesota gets the ball back to start the fourth quarter, the man who surpassed Jim Marshall to become the NFL's all-time Iron Man is somehow able to hobble back in the game without missing a single snap of his 309th consecutive start. But even just handing the ball to Harvin is a struggle. When he does for the second straight time, Harvin fumbles, and despite being in a plausible position to dive on it, 
Favre's heavily taped, badly injured ankle has sapped just about all his mobility, and the Saints take over deep in Viking territory. It's not long before Breeze and Bush link up for a short score that will compel the battered 40-year-old Favre to engineer a fourth quarter comeback. He appears up for the task. When he encounters third and 10 from midfield, he slings a 30-yard bullet to bury him. His next pass is also complete to Berrien, and it's good for a first down inside the Saints' 10, but again, Minnesota coughs the ball up on a well-timed punch out by corner Tracy Porter, ruining a golden opportunity to tie the game. Their defense quickly gives them another chance though, and one big third down conversion, one big Peterson carry, and one big pass interference set up Peterson's third touchdown to knot the game at 28. The Vikings' D, which has been incredible in the second half, having forced three and outs on three of the last four Saints drives, now makes it four out of five to give the ball to their offense with two and a half minutes left, all three timeouts, and a chance to orchestrate a walk-off field goal drive to send them to the Super Bowl. They're in danger of having to punt back to Drew Brees and the Saints on third and long, when Greg Williams dials up a six-man pressure package and Favre is able to unload the ball just in time to Berrien, who's initially short of the sticks, but breaks a tackle to keep the drive alive. Favre then fires a pass to a well-covered Sidney Rice who makes the contested catch on a throw that had to be perfectly placed. One more first down and they'll be in field goal range for Ryan Longwell and a Chester Taylor carry on the next play gets it. The ball sits on the Saints' 33-yard line. From here, it'd be a 51-yard field goal attempt, and the appropriately named Longwell's been good on each of his last eight tries from 50-plus yards out. They can simply prioritize protecting the ball and keeping it on the ground to try and make the kick a bit shorter. Taylor takes a handoff and is unable to gain anything. Then Peterson takes a handoff and is unable to gain anything. That brings up third down. For the Minnesota Vikings, this is arguably the biggest play of the game, the biggest play of the season, and perhaps the biggest play since the Fran Tarkenton era over 30 years ago. And they send 12 men in the huddle. Five yard penalty. It's an agonizing blow. The difference from attempting a field goal at the 33 and from the 38 is a big one, but a Vikings win still looks probable. Longwell is a 13-year vet who's booted through more high-pressure field goals than he can count, and the Dome offers him optimal conditions. On 3rd and 15, with 19 seconds remaining and a timeout left, Favre has an opportunity to pick up a couple more invaluable yards and make life just a little bit easier for his kicker. Favre rolls right. If he doesn't find an open man, he has the luxury of simply throwing it away and keeping the field position they do have. But here, an enticing window opens. He has room to tuck and run, and since he has a timeout in his pocket, he doesn't even need to make it out of bounds. If he can just pick up three yards, those yards might make history. Years into the future, we will have good reasons to resent Brett Favre. But we're not there yet. We're here. And here, what we see is a 40-year-old, a man months away from becoming a grandfather, who's been brutalized beyond the confines of football. Yes, he signed an eight-figure contract to take hard hits, but he did not sign up for this. No player does. In that sense, you feel pity for him here, and you might understand why he doesn't want to put himself on the front line. He's banged up. He may already have suspected that a hit's been placed on him, and that if he slides to give himself up, he might simply be exposing himself to a cheap shot. You feel a more sophisticated sort of pity mixed with equal parts despondency and exasperation after what he does next. Unwilling to run, unwilling to throw it away, the 2009 calculating mistake averse Brett Favre disappears, and the old gunslinger, the wheeler and dealer himself chooses this instance to reemerge from a season of dormancy. The Vikings bought the ticket now in the worst circumstances imaginable. They ride the ride. Favre does what every high school quarterback is coached not to do. He throws across the field. Rolling right and throwing left means his field of visibility is compromised. So while he sees his man Sidney Rice, he does not account for Tracy Porter lurking in the periphery, jumping out in front of Rice and easily locking in on the interception. A very good chance to punch a ticket to the Super Bowl has been needlessly thrown in the garbage. 
At this point in history, Brett Favre has attempted more passes than any other quarterback in NFL history by a gigantic margin. He has more experience than anyone ever has, given the stakes and given that it came off the right arm of a man who more than anyone else alive or dead should have known better, this is the worst mistake I have ever seen a quarterback make. Well, that is a catastrophic pick that kills their chance of winning in regulation, their saving grace here is that the game is tied. It does not end their season. The game now moves to sudden death overtime, where the NFL is irrational enough to allow the ultimate epitome of randomness, the flip of a coin, to have colossal implications in crowning the NFC champion. The visiting Vikings call heads. It lands tails. Congratulations to the New Orleans Saints winners of Super Bowl 44. This is their first Super Bowl win. Ah, dang it. <laughs>